I should just put a little warning. Graphic. This is very graphic. Yeah. And there's graphic photos that I found, which I will leave to your editing discretion. So only watch if you are interested. If you're a sicko. What does that make us? Sicko. Mm, great. Ah. <laughs> How was your week, Jackie Dallas? Mmm, fun. It was Super Bowl this week. Oh, yeah. Yes. I kind of lost my voice a little, so I'm going to be a little hoarse. Hey, look, she made appetite. <laughs> okay, you guys couldn't see that, but I think a bunch of salt <laughs> just flung at me. What was that? I emptied the bag, so it was probably like the last of the crumbs she that went on top. She made appetizers. I don't want the end piece. But a little brie and a little cheese and really old. The grapes are a little wrinkly, really but they're old, still good. No, they're still good. They have still been good. here for like three weeks. Mm, so Super Bowl happened. Mm -hmm. LA won. What? What? The Rams. Really good game. Um, I feel like something else happened. I really wanted to tell you about. I went axe throwing for the first time. Oh, that's cool. I invited her. She was too busy for me. It was. But it was really fun. Yeah. I was really good at it. <laughs> I heard Joe and Blake were there. Joe and Blake were there. Blake is so funny. I told him he should have worn flannel and just like leaned into the whole yeah. lumberjack look. Yeah. But the first like 15 throws, nothing. Bounces off, just like couldn't do it. Pathetic. But then something snapped. He stepped into it. And all of a sudden, he got like seven bullseyes in a row. Wow. He's all or nothing. So in case of an apocalypse of any sort, Blake's on my team. Oh my god. Am I on your team? Depends. I what do you mean extra. it depends? How fast do you run? I'm a sprinter from soccer. I was a forward. I was a striker. I was the fastest girl in the field. Were you? Yeah. And ask Mario. I'm still very fast because we sprint randomly sometimes and chase each other. We're kids. We act like five-year-olds. Uh, how was your week? It was good. So just like doing my own thing, Mario's in Egypt, which Egypt. is mom. Egypt? Mm-hmm. What's he in Egypt for? So his mom's 60th birthday just happened and uh, she shows Egypt. They're at this like okay. Egyptian resort that caters to German people. So like, okay, so everyone I tell this story to is so confused, but what we don't understand is that we don't know much about European culture. Mm -hmm. And one thing that Europeans do during the winter, if they're in a cold place, is they want to go vacation somewhere. Holiday. That's warm. They holiday. Yeah, so like how we go down to Cancun, they go south. So the Germans go south to Africa. That does make sense. Yeah. So there's like a resort that caters to german tourists and that's where they are german Egypt. so it's like we go to a resort and we expect them to speak english right. they go to a resort and they, and speak, german. they speak german yep god yeah so my week has been pretty chill i went to mm. a super bowl party where there was like 75 other blonde women it was so weird i'd never been in an environment like that and they all looked the same they all had straight hair and tank tops it was like the new preppy look. And I curled my hair, so I was different. Are you used to being like the only tall blonde girl or? Yeah, I'm used to being the only blonde girl, period. Around all my friends. I don't have any other blonde girl friends. <laughs> I have a handful of Asian friends, but if I'm surrounded by a lot of Asians, I also feel a little displaced. Yeah, mm. why? Just because I never grew up with a lot of other Asians around me. Right. My community in Florida was, I was the only one. I love the pasta sauce. Good. What is it? Um, garlic, olive oil, and I put some of this uh, marinade in there, which is literally, this is embarrassing. Chicken juice? Literally embarrassing. Italian dressing and soy sauce. That's oh, it. yummy. When you cook Italian dressing, it tastes totally different, which is why you should always marinate oh. in it. Oh. Hey, Miss, should we do our intro? Yeah, let's do it. Three. 
I am Vita. I'm Jackie. And we are so glad that you came back. Hello again. This is episode something. We're like in the 21? 20s. <gasps> We're like past our teenage years. Oh my god, I we mean, can drink now. Months. We yeah. can drink now. We can drink now. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, I didn't. Oh gosh. Oh. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh did Jackie burp? Am I not the only burper on this <laughs> channel? It's contagious. I am super proud of us for making it this far. I had no doubt we would make it. No, I had no idea what was going to happen. But once we started going, I was like, okay, we can be doing this. We found our rhythm, you know? Yeah, yeah I know. We have a good system. Um, we have composers who do our scoring for us. Mariano Bravo. and Gonzalo Salino. Hoot, hoot. Thank you so much. I do want to shout out to my graphics. They've improved, and I just want to acknowledge that. And that's it. Yay! We upgraded to Final Cut. Yes, we did. Thank you, Mario. Mm -hmm. Daddy Mario got me a birthday, no, a Christmas gift of Final Cut Pro. Mm -hmm. Well, what is the topic today, my lady? Today we picked, I picked, um, shit, what did I pick? Vampires. Oh yeah, vampire. I picked a serial killer. Vampire, the vampire of Sacramento. Sacramento? You just spit on me. Sacramento. It's Sacramento. What did I say? The vampire of Sacramento. <laughs> the fuck is that? Did I spit on you again? I'm sorry. Take it back. Take it back. The vampire of Sacramento. Oh my god, I love this food. Good. Look at my plate. You're already done. Well, that's good because you're going to be reading the whole time. I want my pasta though. Ooh, Ew, pasta. it looks so gross. <sighs> oh, no. It's good that you finished eating. You might not want to eat more. Okay, I want more pasta. Richard Trenton Chase was a California serial killer and necrophile who terrorized Northern California in the late 1970s. He was nicknamed the Vampire of Sacramento because he drank his victim's blood and cannibalized their remains, eating their internal organs. <laughs> oh, he looks so gross. He's so gross. I'm so sorry that I put his face on the screen. Ugh. Richard Trenton Chase was born on May 23rd. Your birthday! Finally! 1950. Oh, finally, we know the truth. This bitch is old. Look at that vampire skin. She's a vampire. <laughs> She's not aging. There's a helicopter out there. Hold your sound. <laughs> Richard was born in Sacramento, California, and raised in a strict household, beaten often by his father. His parents would often bicker, and he would eventually have a younger sister who was born when he was four years old. By the age of 10, he was already killing and mutilating animals and starting fires. He also was a persistent bedwetter, which along with the factors of animal cruelty and arson are traits known as the McDonald Triad or the Triad of Sociopathy. Is that how you say it? Sociopathy. Thank you. Or the Triad of Sociopathy. Sociopathy, shopping beer, McDonald Triad, or the Triad of, say it, sociopathy, which are predictive of violent tendencies and serial offenses. I just learned about the McDonald Triad. I have no idea what it is, mm. but it it's those things. It's basically saying if you exhibit those three traits. The probability of you becoming a violent person in the Are future high. is very high. Wow. Those are indicative. If you have two out of the three, it's high. But if you have three out of three, it's like super high. It's just basically saying that you're going to be a fucked up person. Wow. By the time he was a teenager, he was already drinking and smoking dope heavily. Dope meaning marijuana? Yeah. And getting into trouble as a result. And he showed no shame in it. No smoke shots. Yeah. From his first arrest when wow. he was 19. Yeah, he doesn't have any shame. Mm -mm. And that was like a drug-related offense. In high school, Chase had a handful of girlfriends. 
none of whom he was able to maintain a steady relationship with, however. One would report that Rick was unable to perform sexually because he could not maintain an erection. Upon consulting a psychiatrist, Chase was told that the root of his problems was either repressed rage or mental illness. Chase did not seek any further treatment after this diagnosis. It would later be determined that Chase had an, had an aversion to conventional sex and could only achieve arousal and orgasm through violence or disturbed acts, such as killing animals or necrophilia. Ew. This is one of the more disturbing cases we've covered. That'd be great. Because Casey Anthony's case wasn't disturbing enough. Well, no, that was. That was like heart wrenching. This is more like gore. Oh. Like toolbox killers. You remember mm. that one? Oh, anyway. Chase developed hypochondria as he matured, which became more and more unreasonable as time passed. He often complained that his heart would occasionally stop beating. Once he went to the emergency room, claiming that someone had stolen his pulmonary artery. I don't know how that would be possible, Chase. He would hold oranges on his head, believing that vitamin C would be absorbed by his brain via diffusion. Chase also believed that his cranial bones had become separated and were moving around. So he shaved his head to be able to watch this activity. Hmm. He was evaluated by one psychiatrist who diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic, but then thought he might actually be suffering from a drug-induced toxic psychosis. He was put under observation for 72 hours and recommended that he stay longer, but at the end, he was released. Chase lived at home with his parents early in his adulthood, where he began to accuse his mother of attempting to murder him via poison. Because of this conflict, his father forced him to move out of the house. After leaving his mother's, Chase rented an apartment with friends. Chase's roommates complained that he was constantly under the influence of alcohol, marijuana, and LSD. Chase would also walk around the apartment nude, even in front of company. On one occasion, he nailed his bedroom door shut because people were invading his space. Chase's roommates demanded that he move out, and when he refused, the roommates moved out instead. So I once lived with a crazy girl, me and my roommate, there was three of us, we demanded that she move out because she was acting bananas. She was acting super crazy. And with her like psycho little face, she was like, no, I won't move out. And I was like, yo, this girl is not normal. So me and my friend moved out. It's the same scenario. She's just not a vampire that we know of. <laughs> Once alone in the apartment, Chase began to capture, kill, and disembowel various animals, which he would then devour raw, sometimes mixing the raw organs with Coca-Cola in a blender and drinking the concoction. Jackie, I'm sorry. I when you read this, a lot of details. When you read this, were you like, oh, this will be so fun to relive again when Vita reads it out loud. Is that what you thought? And then when we edit it and we have to read it again. Is that what you thought? This is disgusting. This is a really gross story. This is so gross. This is a really gross, really gross. First, it gets so much worse. Okay, well listen, I already have questions. Like how? I feel like we don't do, we, I like space out the crazy stories, you know? I just like, how does a, how does a person like this exist? Uh, like, what kind of human are you that you like want to eat raw animals blended with Coca-Cola? What the fuck? It gets worse. All right, so Chase believed that by ingesting the creatures, he was preventing his heart from shrinking. He feared that if it shrank too much, it would disappear and then he would die. Me too, that's what I worried about also. Chase spent a brief time in a psychiatric ward in the mid seventies. He had been taken to the hospital for blood poisoning and it was determined that his sepsis was caused by injecting rabbit's blood into his veins. He blamed his condition on the rabbit, stating that that rabbit had ingested battery acid and that's what made him sick. 
when there was talk about having him transferred to a mental institution, <laughs> duh, <laughs> he ran away from the hospital and went home to his mama dearest. Mm. He was like, I'd rather be poisoned. <laughs> He was apprehended and then involuntarily committed to Beverly Manor. Oh, that's a famous place. I think. Oh, well, I'll Google it. Because I was right about Simon Birch. That have was a movie. Have you been there? Beverly Manor? Uh-huh. What do you mean have I been there? Have you been there? Have you been there? A mental institution for the criminally, criminally insane. There, he would share with the staff fantasies about killing rabbits. <laughs> so dumb. He was once found with blood smeared all around his mouth and staff had discovered that he had caught two birds through the bars of his room's window, snapped their necks, and drank their blood. He is a vampire, isn't he? He was also caught extracting blood from therapy dogs with stolen syringes. The staff began calling him Dracula because of his blood fixation. Chase was once again diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, suffering from somatic, somatic delusions. An initial trial of antipsychotic medications failed to work after undergoing a battery of treatments involving psychotropic drugs, psychotropic, psychotropic? Uh, psychotropic? Psychotropic drugs. Chase was deemed no longer a danger to society, and later in 1976, he was released into his mother's custody, who was by now divorced from Chase's father. He was granted a conservatorship, a very much needed conservatorship, unlike Britney Spears's a man. Mm. Once at home, Chase's mother believed that her son no longer needed to be on the anti- <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> this is just terrible. Beyond the anti schizophrenic medication that he was prescribed. As if she knew what the fuck she was talking about. Schizophrenia, you need to be on it forever. She got him his own apartment where she paid his rent and brought him his groceries. Once again, left unsupervised. He began to capture, torture to death, and then drink the blood of rabbits, dogs, and cats. On multiple occasions, he killed and ate neighbors' pets and at least once contacted the neighbor by telephone to explain what he had done. Mm. Jackie, uh -huh. what would you do if someone called you? Like, said, do you have a cat? I drank cat's blood. I honestly don't know what okay. I would do. What about Quinn? I would probably first hang up thinking it was like a sick prank. Yeah. And I would hunt that fucker down. <laughs> but Kat, and she's like, I don't know what I would do for Kat. But Quinny, there's no question. I don't play favorites. So I just want to say if anyone called me and told me they drink Susie's blood. I drink their blood. Ew. No, I'm just kidding. I would just chop them up into pieces. More chill. Way more chill. <laughs> One day in 1977, Chase rang his mother's doorbell and greeted her by thrusting a dead cat in her face. Look, mommy, look what I have. <laughs> he then threw the cat to the ground, knelt down, ripped its stomach open with his bare hands and stuck his hands inside the cat, smearing its blood all over his face while screaming. His mother calmly returned inside the house and did not report the incident to anyone. I just picture her be like, my son's home. <laughs> just I can't process this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't deal with this. Soon after, the court awarded conservatorship expired and his parents did nothing to renew it. Chase was left on his own. He was 27 or 28 at this point. Yeah. Chase began to lose interest in caring for himself. He neglected personal hygiene, such as bathing, grooming, and brushing his teeth. He stopped eating and dropped to the fairly meager weight of 145 pounds. I guess if he's tall. Yeah, I don't know how tall he was. Yeah, I mean. But for a man, I think even if you're a short man, like 145 is still small. Well, my ex, Jeremy, mm -hmm. was like my height. 
and like right around that weight. Yeah. He was skinny, but I wouldn't say that he was a meager weight, mm -hmm. you know? So he must be a tall, like if Mario was 145 pounds, mm -hmm. that would look very scary. How tall is Jeremy? My height. Five, nine? And a half, yeah. On August 3rd, 1977, Nevada State Police discovered Chase's Ford Ranchero lodged in a sand drift near Pyramid Lake, Nevada. Inside were two rifles, a pile of clothes, a bucket full of blood, and a liver. Was he bringing this liver over to our other criminal? Um, what's his name? Gary Evans? <laughs> oh. The officers tracked down Chase who was naked and screaming in the sand, soaked from head to toe in blood. After a brief pursuit, he was apprehended. Ew, can you imagine like handcuffing a naked dude Trying to, like, tackle him in the each. sand who's full of blood? I'd be like, nah, Just, like, you, 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 you do it, you do it, you do it. Uh oh, that's when you'd like want the taser. <laughs> when they questioned Chase, he claimed that the blood was of his own and that it had leaked out of him through his flesh. He was arrested and the blood and liver were found to be that of a cow. No charges were filed. At the same time, he developed a fascination for firearms. Safe. And purchased several handguns with which he practiced obsessively. Mm. He also set fire to a neighbor's garage because their music annoyed him. Well, whoop de doo He became fascinated by the crimes of the Hillside Strangler, collecting news articles and editorials about him. He believed the Strangler was also the victim of a Nazi UFO conspiracy that he believed he was the victim of. He believed that he was persecuted by Nazis for being Jewish, which he was not and having the Star of David on his forehead, which he did not. He explained that the Nazis were telepathically connected to UFOs, which were commanding him to kill to replenish his blood. <laughs> Without his medication, his schizophrenia had returned fully and he had developed a delusion that Nazis had planted poison underneath his bathroom soap dish. When asked later about his conspiracy, he would explain that everyone has a soap dish. If you lift the soap and find that underneath it is dry, then you're all right. If it's gooey, you've been poisoned and your blood will turn to powder. This will deplete your energy and eat away at your body unless your blood is replenished. That is so wacky doodly. Doesn't make any sense. So if you just stopped washing, it would stay dry. His first murder would occur shortly after his mother would not allow him to visit for Christmas. He was just angrily shooting his gun outside the window of his chair. One of the bullets would find its way into the home of a Sacramento woman. A police search of the woman's house found the slug in her kitchen. Slug is the bullet, I believe, but no one was harmed. On December 29th, 1977, Chase killed his first known victim in a drive-by shooting. He referred to it as a warm-up for the crimes he planned on committing. The victim, Ambrose Griffin, a 51-year-old engineer and father of two, who was helping his wife bring groceries into their home. It has nothing to do with him sucking blood. Nope, it's a warm-up. He's practicing. Suddenly, there were two pops of noise and Griffin fell to the ground calling to his wife, my God, I've been shocked. He would later bleed to death from getting shot in the chest at a nearby hospital. Man, that's sad. See, Cass just trying to go back outside. She's like, I was hungry, so I came home, and now I demand to be let out again. What a fucking teenager. One of Griffin's sons reported seeing a neighbor walking around their West Sacramento neighborhood with a rifle earlier that week. The police apprehended the man, and the rifle was seized. But ballistics tests determined that it was not the murder weapon. However, it was later determined that the 22 used to kill Ambrose Griffin was the same one used to fire the bullet into the kitchen of the Sacramento woman two days before. Another boy, a 12 year old, 
would come forward and report that a man with brown hair had shot at him from a Pontiac Trans Am as he was riding his bike. After routine questioning with little progress, he was put under hypnosis where he recalled a license plate number, 219EEP. However, this information led them nowhere. So it didn't work. It didn't work. Or he got shot at by another person. From what I read, it wasn't the best neighborhood. It seems like there were issues that happened a lot. And a Pontiac Grand Am would never get mistaken for a Ranchero, a Ford Ranchero. Right. Totally different cars. Totally different aesthetics. Just after the new year in 1978, Chase's neighbor in the same apartment complex, Don Larson, noticed that in the six months that he'd been there, she'd seen him bring in three animals against the apartment's complex, against the apartment complex's no pet palace, uh, no pet policy. But she had never seen those animals again. One day, Chase asked her for a cigarette, which she gave. When she tried to walk away, he then forcibly restrained her until she gave him the entire pack. Just buy cigarettes, bro. Two weeks later, Jeannie Layton spotted an unkept young man strolling towards her home. She watched as he tried her patio door, found it locked, and then went to the windows, all of which were locked. Jeannie confronted him through the glass face to face. He showed no emotions as he looked at her then turned, paused to light a cigarette, and walked away through her backyard. Hey, cat. You wanna come up here? It's so cute. <laughs> Look at my anus. Look at my anus. Hey, cat. Stop ignoring us. As he wandered around the area, continuing to test doors, he encountered a girl named Nancy Holden, with whom he attended high school. She was shopping at the town and country village shopping center nearby and saw the strange man approaching her. Were you on the motorcycle when Kurt was killed? He asked her. Nancy was startled. 10 years prior, she had dated a boy named Kurt who had been killed after a motorcycle accident. She then realized that this man was Rick Chase. He looked nothing like the studious clean cut Rick she had known in school. Ah, it's a completely different person. Totally different person, right? But he looks cute here. Normal, like preppy. She had heard that he had gotten into drugs and had not seen him since. After a few minutes of polite conversation, she managed to pull away while he was distracted. He followed her into the parking lot and asked if he could get a ride. She managed to just get into her car, roll up the windows, and lock the doors as he caught up to her. Frightened, she refused and drove off. She is smart. So lucky. Back then, I think it was like the cranky yeah. windows too, and you're just like, oh. Okay. Yeah. He went through the neighborhood backyards until he found an unlocked back door of Robert and Barbara Edwards' home, a young married couple. They had just pulled up and were beginning to bring groceries into their home when they heard a noise inside. When they unlocked the door, the noise spooked the intruder and they only heard a window slam at the back of the house. Then from around the corner of the front of the house, an oddly disheveled young man strolled out. Edwards tried to stop him, but the man sprinted past and jumped over the fence. When the police arrived, they found the house in shambles. There were stolen valuables, but the intruder had also urinated in a into a drawer of their infant's clothing and defecated on their son's bed. Weird. So weird. He's crazy. He's so creepy. Chase continued to attempt to break and enter into homes. And on January 23rd, 1978, he came across the home of David and Teresa Wallen. They're a cute couple. Mm. This is bad. Okay. David was working, making a 250 mile round trip drive to and from Lake Tahoe for business as a sales driver for a linen company. Teresa, or Terry, her nickname, was three months pregnant with a boy they planned to call Dane. She was in the middle of taking out the garbage and thus had left her front door unlocked. Chase placed a single 22 caliber bullet into the mailbox and then surprised her in the home, shooting her three times. Once in the hand, defensive wound, and once in the top part of her skull. 
She fell and then Chase knelt over her, firing a third bullet into her temple, killing her. It was the same gun used to kill Ambrose Griffin. Why'd he do that? Chase then dragged her body to her bedroom and raped it post-mortem while repeatedly stabbing it with a butcher's knife. When he had finished, he carved the corpse open and removed several of her internal organs, using a bucket to collect the blood and then taking it in the bathroom to bathe in it. He then sliced off her nipple and drank her blood using an empty yogurt container as a drinking glass. This is really disturbing. Mm, it's a really bad case. We why, haven't done a really bad case in a while. Why would one human do this to another human? I just don't understand. And I'm, you know, we haven't even gotten to the part yet of like the husband coming home to find his beautiful mm. pregnant wife like this, but like, why? Why? What was he, he has, thinking? He's not. He's uh, he's got uncontrolled, untreated, rampant schizophrenia with delusions. Schizophrenia needs to be medicated once it comes on because you don't know what is what and there's like incessant, you know, speakings in your ear that yeah. tell you things that are completely untrue. And no matter how bizarre or fabricated UFOs, Nazis, poisonous soap dishes, you believe it because it's just information you're receiving constant, right? Yeah. At 6 p.m., David Wallen came home to find the house dark. He entered and found that the stereo was on. There was trash thrown around, concerning stains on the carpet, and their German shepherd waiting inside the house. When he followed the trail of stains through the hall into the bedroom, he began to scream. Okay, this is the photo. Mm -hmm. It's really graphic. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's really upsetting. Okay. It's really upsetting. Okay, I saw it. It's probably the worst photo I've found. Authorities would find her body on its back with her knees laid open in the position of sexual assault. Her sweater was pulled up over her breasts, her pants and underwear down around her ankles. Her torso was cut open from below the sternum with her spleen and entrails pulled out. She had been repeatedly stabbed in the lung, liver, diaphragm, and left breast. He had also se severed her pancreas and cut out her kidneys before placing them back inside of her. In a final act of, act of desecration, they also found dog feces stuffed into her mouth and throat. Mm. I just don't follow the train of thought, which clearly means that I'm not crazy like this person. Two days later, Chase purchased two puppies from a neighbor who recalled a strange man with stringy hair that was driving a ranchero. He didn't seem to have a preference whether he got male or female dogs, which clocked the neighbors as odd. Later, the puppies' bodies were found on the neighbor's front lawn, killed, mutilated, and drained of blood. So one time in Chicago, I was in a wealthier part of Chicago um, and I was walking down the street and I was just like acknowledging like the cleanliness and I was like, wow, it's so clean because it's so wealthy here. But then like as I was approaching down the sidewalk, there was this plastic bag and it was a trash bag. And I was like, oh, okay, there's a little bit of a mess. And I kept approaching and it was a white trash bag. So that means it's transparent. More or less, yeah. Guess what was inside of it? A puppy. No. It was so heartbreaking. I didn't know what to do. I was so sickened. I was by myself. And a couple of feet in front of me, like 50 feet, was a fire station. And so I ran over to the fire station and I was like banging on doors. And they're like, what? And I was like, I just found a puppy in a plastic bag. And they're like, it's dead. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, well, there's nothing we can do at this point. And I was like, well, clean it up. You know, like, do something with it. They're like, okay, miss, like, we'll handle it. And I was like, okay. Uh, I'm sure Chicago police has, like, bigger issues, but I would be very upset. I look like a baby pit bull. Oh, it's so upsetting. 
after the Wallen murder, FBI agents Russ Vorpagel and Robert Ressler were called in to investigate. They compiled a profile of the killer, guessing him to be tall, malnourished, physically unclean, and a loner. They figured he was a disorganized killer, with some clues pointing to psychosis and drug use. They assumed he did not plan these crimes and did little to hide or destroy evidence, including blood on the clothing that he probably walked around in. They deduced from the close proximity of the crime scenes that he might not have a car and likely lived in the vicinity. Most importantly, they suspected he would kill again. I think it's crazy how precise police profiling or FBI profiling can be based on like circumstantial evidence, you know? I don't know if it's circumstantial, but just like not photograph or, you know, CCTV or something. They're able to like figure these things out. On January 27th, Chase entered the home of 38-year-old Evelyn Muruth, who lived a mile from the Wallen residence. She was at the time babysitting her 22-month-old nephew, David, and also in her own home was her six-year-old son, Jason, and 51-year-old Dan Meredith, a friend who had come over to check on Evelyn. Evelyn was in the bath as Dan watched the children. He went into the front hallway when Chase entered the home and was shot in the head at point-blank range with his 22 handgun, killing him instantly. Chase turned Dan's body over, stole his wallet and car keys. Jason, who had ran into his mother's bedroom, frightened, was followed by Chase, who shot him twice in the head at point-blank range. On the way, he spotted baby David and shot him too. Why? Jason Moreau. Six years old. I'm so sad. Finally, he entered the bathroom and shot Evelyn once in the head. He dragged her lifeless body onto the bed where he simultaneously sodomized it and drank her blood from a series of slices to the back of her neck. When he had finished, he stabbed her at least a half dozen times in the anus, penetrating her uterus and a series of vital points on the body which caused blood from her internal organs to pool in her abdomen. He then sliced her belly open, drained the blood into a bucket and drank it. It also appeared that he tried to cut out an eye. He then went to retrieve baby David's corpse, took it into the bathtub, split his head open. Oh, I knew it, I closed my eyes and consumed some of his brain matter. Meanwhile, outside, a six-year-old girl who Jason Moreau had a play date with knocked on the door. <sighs> Jason was supposed to go over to her house and when he didn't show up, the little girl went to his house to look for him. This startled Chase, who fled the residence, stealing Dan's car. Okay, I thought that he was gonna murder this little girl too. I was really scared he was going to also. The girl returned home saying that no one had opened the door, but she saw someone inside the house. The neighbors concerned broke into the home. Oh God. And discovered the bodies and then contacted the police. Upon investigation, police discovered perfect handprints and bloody shoe prints all over the home that matched those found at the Wallen murder scene. They found Dan, Evelyn, and Jason's bodies as described before, but unbeknownst to them at the time, there was one body missing. Not realized until later when Karen Ferriera arrived to pick up her son, missing from the crime scene was the body of the 22-month-old David, who only left behind a bullet hole in a crib with a lot of blood. Mother. Chase had taken David's small body with him once home, Chase chopped off the toddler's penis and drained all the blood from its body. 
He then consumed several internal organs, making smoothies out of others, and finally disposed of the corpse at a nearby church. Oh my god, this is a gross episode. This is so gross. This is so gross. This is more gross than a different vampire, one that I've listened to on a different podcast. Mm -hmm. There's some vampire in Japan that got caught, and like what he did was rape little girls, but he didn't do all of this. Like, he sucked the blood of little girls and raped them, but he didn't do all of this. He didn't chop off penises. Uh, the only saving grace in all of this is that he killed everyone before he mutilated their bodies, so there wasn't any torture involved. He did. He didn't murder them immediately. It would be another two months. What? Ugh, they have handprints. It would be another two months before the body of the baby would be found by a church janitor. The baby had been decapitated, and the head was placed under the torso in a box, which was partially mummified. There were several stab wounds and several ribs were broken. In the box was also the ring of keys that fit Dan Meredith's car. When questioning neighbors, they then located an 11-year-old girl in the neighborhood who described a man near the victim's residence around 11 o'clock that morning. She described him in his early 20s, and he fit the description of a man seen repeatedly in that area, walking around asking people for magazines. Dan Meredith's red station wagon was missing from the front of the house where neighbors had seen it parked that morning. Meredith's vehicle would be found abandoned not far from the murder scene in a parking lot, only about 100 yards from apartment 15 of the Watt Avenue apartment complex where Richard Chase lived. 100 yards. Five days after the mass murder and hearing about the FBI profile, Nancy Holden contacted the police saying she believed Richard Chase could be the killer. And this is his former this classmate? Is, this is the girl, yeah, at the town and country that okay. he talked to. She told them of her encounter with him and mentioned that he was wearing the same orange parka that day and was sure that he was the man they were looking for. Wow, she was very certain. So this is a police sketch? Mm -hmm. The police ran a background check on Chase, where they came across his history of mental illness, a series of minor drug busts, and the bizarre arrest in Nevada, and a concealed weapons charge with the registration of a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Detectives and a team of police went to Chase's apartment, where they asked to speak with him. Chase refused to open the door. Without a warrant, the detectives and the police hid down the hallway and waited for Chase to leave. They arrested him when he left the apartment dressed in a blood-stained orange parka and shoes. He was carrying a blood-stained box and inside were pieces of shredded, blood-soaked papers and rags and the blood-stained 22 with which he had committed the murders. Chase claimed that the bloody wallpaper and bloody gun were a result of his killings of several dogs. When the police performed a search of Chase when the police performed a search of Chase's person, they found that he was carrying Meredith's wallet in his back pocket, along with a pair of latex gloves. Detectives, along with Rustler and Warpagel, performed a search of Chase's apartment. The place was putrid and smelled of decay. Every surface and item in the home was bloodstained, including the walls, floor, ceiling, refrigerator, and all of Chase's eating and drinking utensils. On the counter was the blender Chase used to make his smoothies, caked in coagulated blood and the rotting matter of internal organs. Inside the refrigerator, police found several animal body parts wrapped in aluminum foil, David's brains in a Tupperware container, and pieces of his body wrapped in saran wrap, and several of Evelyn Muroth and Teresa Wallen's internal organs. On another counter were several pet collars, on his kitchen table, he had spread out numerous diagrams depicting various aspects of human biology from a science book, along with newspaper ads where dog sales were circled. A calendar was also found with the inscription today, written in the dates of the Wallen and Meroth Merith murders. Chillingly, the same word was written on 44 more dates yet to come in the future. So he was planning to commit 44 more murders on 44 more days. He just got apprehended before he could. Because of that girl, because she had good instincts. Yeah. Evidence was gathered from his residence. You know what's crazy? It was reading a thing about her and when she was reporting it, and she actually like said 
I felt bad leaving him and not giving him a ride, just running away. She's like, I felt bad because it was rude. Well, I always say it's okay to be fucking rude. You know, I never say that. But I feel like that's a huge factor that comes into play with women versus like antagonistic men situations. Totally. We're afraid to be rude or um, to upset them. But I feel you know? like, okay. But if you can get away, to you play, get away. To play <laughs> devil's advocate, I feel like women are never nice to creepy, ugly men. I think if it's an attractive guy, then we are more polite and we put up with their shenanigans. But if it's like a creepy, weird dude, mm -hmm. I think we're very quick to be very disrespectful. I think it That's depends on the think. situation. I, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it depends on the situation. I feel like that's what harbors so much anger in some of these like weird or creepy guys because they feel like, so they feel just so rejected by so many people. Not this guy. He was like a popular kid in high school, it seems, but mm -hmm. you know, incels. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Evidence was gathered from his residence and his and his persons to be analyzed. And while they had no problems with most samplings, he had to be restrained when attempting to take a blood sample from him. So he wants all the blood, but he won't get any. Got it. They did not yet know of his primal fear of losing his own blood. His mother, when questioned, was uncooperative, insisting that despite what they had found, it did not prove that her son had actually done anything. Mom is so confusing in this case. What is her problem? She's so confusing in this case. Like, I'd like to hear a write-up of, like, her profile, you know? Because she, like, abandoned her son numerous times. Like, kicked him out before. Came back after he'd been institutionalized. Put him back into an apartment. Let the conservatorship cancel out. And just never really took, it took him off the medication. Yeah, she the makes no you know, sense. Like she makes no sense. Given the local notoriety of the case, the trial was moved 120 miles south to Santa Clara County. Clara. Santa Clara, Santa Clara County. The lead prosecutor was Ronald W. Tochterman, intended to see the death penalty. But in effort to avoid it, the defense tried to have him found not guilty by reason of insanity. No, kill him. Kill him. Kill him. There is nothing here to save. Literally, he's just so... He's, dis he's so disgusting. No rehabilitation. Talk German was determined to show that Chase knew the difference between right and wrong. Part of his strategy included brushing up on the legends of Dracula. He also read about blood-related crimes and blood rituals in various cultures, noting that some people believe that ingesting another person's blood would strengthen or heal them. He wanted to show that while this might be a belief, it was not an excusable reason for murder. It's very thorough. I respect that lawyer. He's like, this is a ridiculous case. I'm going to build a ridiculous offense. Argument. Yeah. A dozen psychiatrists had examined Chase. He admitted to one that he was disturbed about killing his victims and he was afraid they might come for him from the dead. There was no evidence in his admissions that he had ever felt compelled to kill. He simply thought the blood was therapeutic. One psychiatrist found him to be an antisocial personality, not schizophrenic. His thought processes were not disrupted and he was aware of what he had done and what that in that it was wrong, but would do them anyways. Well, that kills the argument. On January 2nd, 1979, the trial began. Chase was charged with six counts of murder. The prosecutor emphasized throughout the trial that Chase had had a choice and mentioned several times that he had brought rubber gloves with him to the victim's homes, demonstrating intent of murder. Altogether, there were 250 prosecution exhibits, the strongest of which were Chase's gun and Dan Meredith's wallet found in Chase's pocket. They would call nearly 100 witnesses over the four month trial, starting with David Wallen, who described the scene of horror he encountered when he came home that day. Chase then took the stand in his own defense. He looked awful 
having dropped in weight to 107 pounds. That's sickly. Yeah. His eyes were sunken and lusterless. He claimed to have been semi-conscious during the Wallen murder and admitted to drinking her blood. He did not recall much about the second series of murders, but knew that he had shot the baby in the head and decapitated it, leaving it in a bucket in the hope of getting more of its blood. He thought the baby was something else, but did not elaborate. Did he think it was a rabbit, do you think? I don't know. Two, but, 22 did, months, two-year-old, practically a two-year-old. I mean, that's bigger than a tiny little infant, you know? That's like... That's a walking, toddling little person. I'm just trying to think of what he confused it with. He described in detail the way he had been mistreated much of his life. He thought that his problems stemmed from his instability to have sex with girls as a teenager. And he said he was sorry for the killings. The defense altered their plea from not guilty to a verdict of second degree murder to spare Chase the death penalty since he was clearly insane and had never been given proper help. Tokterum unrelentingly argued that he was a sexual sadist, a monster who knew what he was doing and who could not be salvaged. Mm -mm. I agree. Can't be salvaged. On May 8th, 1978, the jury only took five hours to deliberate. First, there was a sanity evaluation phase, after which the jury found Chase legally sane after deliberating for only one hour. Then, rejecting the notion of insanity, a mere four hours later, they returned a verdict of six counts of first-degree murder and decided that Chase should die in the gas chamber at San Quentin Penitentiary. Oh, Finally, yeah. we get a case where they actually convict and like sentence Do again, something the right? first time they catch yeah. him. Finally. But also he did like really gruesome crimes. Like, yeah, really. <laughs> it's not like he stole something. Like, But I just, I feel like there's so many cases where they just get caught, get let off, get caught, get let off. Right. But that's not like eating organs and what he did here. Eating brains. There in San Quentin, his fellow inmates, aware of the extremely violent and bizarre nature of Chase's crimes, feared him and, according to prison officials, often tried to persuade Chase to commit suicide, too afraid to close enough to kill him themselves. I don't blame him. I, I read that wrong because I thought it was getting, I thought they were scared he was going to eat them. <laughs> well, they were. Chase admitted to another inmate that he had drunk the blood. Isn't it drank the blood? I don't know. It is. Inmate that he had drank the blood of his victims because he had blood poisoning and needed it. He began killing humans because he had gotten tired of hunting and killing animals. Chase granted a series of interviews with Robert K. Ressler, during which he spoke of his fears of the Nazis and the UFOs, claiming that although he had killed, it was not his fault. He had been forced to kill to keep himself alive, which he believed any person would do. He asked Ressler to give him access to a radar gun with which he could apprehend the Nazi US UFOs so that the Nazis could stand trial for the murders. Okay, I'm sorry. I just had this thought pop into my head. So mm -hmm. while he's working with the lawyers trying to get off of death penalty, mm -hmm. he goes along with what the lawyers want him to do. So that's mm -hmm. his reality. Now that he's in prison, he's switched back to the mindset that he does know that he murdered everyone and that the Nazis and the UFOs made him do it, are making him do it, right? It's like his schizophrenic phrenic brain is jumping around realities I of think, what yeah. he thinks he, what he thinks is real. I don't firsthand know anyone who's like really schizophrenic and my I obviously is, like I don't. I've talked about it a yeah. lot, my uncle no, is. No, no, you have, you have. but. My impression, based on like what I've heard and what I've read, and I could be completely wrong about this, is that because uh, schizophrenia, like people hear and see hallucinations, they don't know what's real and what's not real. And I think the shade of like what's right and what's not right, that is entirely like subjective to them. So the other thing- So that's what they were saying. Like he's sane, he's not insane, he is sane. He knows what's right. He knows what's wrong. 
He just chooses to do what he knows is wrong because he thinks he has to, that he's justifying the murder because one, the Nazis and the UFOs are telling him to, and then two, if he doesn't, he'll die. The other thing about schizophrenia is not everyone, not everyone sees things and not everyone hears things. It's Correct. Like, there's Correct. different there's, ways. It's a spectrum. Yeah. It's a spectrum. Um, but he's very like far yeah. ends. But yeah. it just seems like and a lot of, a lot of schizophrenics are never even violent. Like that's a that's right. a complete misconception because of Hollywood and sensationalized cases like this. Tons of schizophrenic people never like they have to be medicated, yes, but they never resort to violent, murderous, psychopathic behavior. They hear things, they see things, it drives them nuts, but it's not them whispering in their ear like you need to kill puppies and people. Yeah. He also handed Ressler a large amount of macaroni and cheese, which he had been hoarding in his pant pockets, believing that the prison officials were in league with the Nazis and attempting to kill him with poisoned food. When Ressler asked how Chase selected his victims, he said he simply went down the streets testing doors to find one that was unlocked. He said that locked doors was a sign that he was not welcome, but unlocked doors were an invitation to come inside. Always lock your doors, guys. On December 26, 1980, the day after Christmas, a day short of the third anniversary of the killing spree, a guard performing a routine cell check noted Chase lying on his back, seemingly asleep. At 11.05 p.m., the same guard on another pass-through this time saw him on his stomach with his legs extended off the bunk and feet on the floor. His face was pressed against the mattress and his arm extended, arms extended overhead. The guard called out to Chase, who did not move. When the guard entered to investigate, Chase was dead. I'm okay with this. I'm curious of how. K.P. Holmes, the coroner, was called because Sherlock was off duty. He searched the cell and located a strange suicide note about taking some pills. Chase had been taking a daily dose of Sinequin, Doxepin, an antidepressant to lessen his hallucinations and depression, which came to his cell in a package of three pills. Apparently, he had hoarded the pills and then overdosed. The cause of his death was toxic ingestion. His heart was found to be normal and in good shape despite his lifelong concern. He was 30 when he died. Wow. His case is still used by the FBI as an archetypal, mo archetypal model for understanding the disorganized killer. There is a syndrome called Renfield syndrome and it's the vampire syndrome there's two kinds actually but Renfield is a psychological syndrome where people um get very attached to the concept of blood and they think it has to do with some sort of early traumatic experience where they associate blood with either um like sexual pleasure or needing to ingest it or it's it's essential to their existence in their life. So there's that compulsion to it. Um, there's another vampire syndrome called porphyria. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, this is where, this is a syndrome where, they, this is not what this guy had, but this is uh, suspected to be where the whole vampire lore came to be. And they had a deep aversion to sunlight they were not able to go out into the sun. They um, were very white and translucent skinned. And I think they had uh, like blood issues in the form of their hemoglobin. Yeah, so I think that's where the lore of vampires came from. But Renfield is what this guy had and Renfield is more of a psychological uh, need for blood. I think it's interesting they have a name for it. Like clearly enough people have it for there to be a name. That's terrifying. Mm. Quinn is very cuddly tonight. She is, because you yelled at her. I did yell at her. So now she's like, mommy, I love me. We both yelled at her. Yeah, because she's bad. She chewed on your shoes. Oh, she fucking ruined feathers. Okay, so 
first thing I'm thinking is ew. First thing is ew. Yeah, no, I, I mean, obviously I'm like really disturbed, Ooh. but I'm just like, I just, I don't know. I guess I just like, didn't really realize, like even though I love true crime, blah, blah, that a person would do something like that. There's terrible, terrible, heinous crimes out there is what we're discovering. Like we think true crime is a missing person here and there, a killer here and there, like, but there's some things that are almost worse than death. No, they are worse than that, not almost. There are, there's things worse than death. And I think this guy, the fact that he did these things to the body after they were dead was a saving grace for the victim. They didn't get tortured. But I mean, they were absolutely desecrated. Yeah. It's just so bizarre to think of like a human treating other humans this way, just like killing them and then ripping them open and eating them and having sex with them. And... I think one thing that's different about this guy though, which I don't know if it's better or worse, he didn't do this for sadistic pleasure though, from what I can gather. He did it because he thought his crazy voices told him he needed to his belief was um, that i don't believe i mean i don't i don't believe that i really just don't i think that i think that he's manipulative and i think that i think he sounded a little manipulative like a little calculated and mm -hmm. like i have a schizophrenic uncle who i for a whole year or so would message back and forth on facebook and it and it felt like when he really wanted a, a reaction from me, he would tap into one part of his personality. And so he knew that if he brought up my dad, I would respond. Mm -hmm. But when he would ramble on about anything else, I would just ignore him because it was so much rambling, so mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. messages that I never answered. And then he would just start a new conversation. Mm -hmm. And it just mm -hmm. seemed like extremely... Like, as unaware as this person came across, mm -hmm. he was extremely aware of what he was doing and what he was saying and what kind of reaction he was going to get. And right. Like, I don't know. Like, he was smart. I he, just, he was an intelligent guy, too. So I think, sure he had that compassion, I think compassion. that there's, you know, if he got all the way through high school. Yeah. I remember Nancy said he was a straight shooter. He was a, he was a studious kid. Yeah. I think it's more of like, because, okay, think of it this way, right? So if, like, we're normal people, right? We would never do that kind of thing. Relatively but normal, we yeah. can, But we can see worsened sides of ourselves if mm -hmm. we drink too much or if we watch too much of a, um, you know, like, you, there's a TV show I was watching too much of, like, I think American Horror Story, mm -hmm. and it was, like, making me feel more on edge. Like if you consume mm -hmm. too much of something that is negative, mm -hmm. it changes you. Sure. So imagine that you're a slightly normal person, or sorry, he's not slightly normal. He's a very off person to begin with, right? But he's consuming this really unhealthy level of, first of all, murdering animals, right? You know, and like, eating them raw, yeah. blending them with Coca-Cola. So it's just like, it's just, it just like, it snowballed. It was like, first it was just like a little weird and then it just got fucked up. And I think like once you enter that space and you're just like in this new space of like, there is no limit, he was aware, like he was aware of the fact that he was really, like he was doing wrong. He was doing so much wrong. And I think he just like had gotten past the point of no return and it just became his way of life. So it's like an alcoholic. Sure. Or a drug addict. In which he was. Apparently. You know, this guy seems to have had just like um, a, a lot of different com conditions compounded that exacerbate his situation. Because antisocial behavior, which is the one that's like one arson and yeah. uh, cruelty to animals and stuff like that, like that kind of behavior, that's a whole separate thing from schizophrenia. People who grow up to be like serial killers and psychopaths have that tendency and they don't have to be schizophrenic just like schizophrenic so he was a combination a combination is what i think is just a really t terrible mix because schizophrenia doesn't present until you're a little older it's not something you find in children usually right it's like in your 20s 30s. 
30s, exactly. Yeah. When you're 20s and 30s, that's when it presents. And if this started happening when he was in the 1977, he was 40, 50. So he was 27 years old when the murders started happening. Yeah, actually murders. Do you see what people. I mean? Like, and the whole Nazi and UFOs and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, but like, the blending of that. rabbit with Coca-Cola was happening when he was living in that apartment. Right after the roommate During got college. kicked out. Yeah, yeah, college time. Which is his 20s, which is fucking But weird. you can present with schizophrenia in your 20s, is what I'm saying. Just because, like, the average or the most common is late 20s, early 30s, doesn't mean it waits until that long. What I'm saying is it doesn't usually present to, like, a, a 5-year-old, right, or a 10-year-old. But clearly, when this kid was 10, he was killing animals. So that's antisocial, and then that just got worse as he became schizophrenic, he was able to hide, or I shouldn't say hide, but oh yeah, yeah, he was able to hide the antisocial tendencies because he wasn't schizophrenic yet. Because through high school, Nancy said that he was composed, he was normal, right. he was studious, he was, His you know, a straight was kid. Normal. But he had been already killing animals yeah. at that point, so he was just hiding it. Yeah. You know? And that's what I'm trying to say, is that this motherfucker was aware of everything he was doing wrong. And that's why in court, his shitty lawyers were trying to defend him to say that he was insane. I'm sorry, did you believe that he didn't mean to do what he did? Like, lawyers just have to do what, like, what they can do. I know? think it's in so this unethical. situation though, you hear him confess and then you tell the truth in court and you say, please spare him the death penalty but don't fucking try to like twist the truth and then he's committed to twisting the truth with you and then he goes to jail and he like completely confesses a whole different story yeah and then talks about the ufos and the nazis and it's just like mm -hmm. and I, I do get a sense that there's a part of the schizophrenic person that knows that what they're saying is extreme because they want to get a reaction out of people and that is mostly why they talk to other people it's because they want a reaction and they're aware that what they're going to share is going to be very excitable and odd and so there's like this level of awareness, but I think that what's hard for us to understand is that the fact that they don't have restraint and therefore we just say like, oh, they can't help themselves. No, I, I believe that they can. That's why medication can work because it can help them restrain themselves. I mean, I just think this guy's a fucking monster. I definitely think he's a monster. I don't know if it can be helped though. I, I think he can I think be medicated. He, no, no, no. Medicate. Yeah. He needs to be medicated. But once I'm, a person's I'm off the medication. I'm saying that it's not like Tourette's. Where Tourette's, it's a compulsive thing coming yeah. out of you. And I think the excuse that like people with this kind of disorder they're given is like, oh, they can't help themselves. And it's like, no, they're aware of the wrong. They're so aware of how evil they're being. Will they restrain themselves? No, they won't. I, I but it's a completely different intention. Yeah, what, what I'm they, trying to identify yeah, yeah. is yeah. that the intention is very evil. Whether they're going to restrain themselves or not, they're being evil. With a person with like Tourette's, which is uncontrollable, mm -hmm. there's no malintent. They can't help it. They're like, you're a fucking cop, bitch. Like, they can't help it. <laughs> no, I'm not making fun of them. I'm saying, I was trying to like give an example of like three really offensive things that they can say, and they really don't mean it. Do you get the point I'm trying to make? I do. I do. So like this guy, and I'm, just, a, I'm agreeing with you on this. I yeah, think, no, I, I know you agree with me. It's not a compulsion thing. I think what it is, is the reason they ultimately end up acting on these like behaviors that they know are wrong is because they have this constant incessant, like for those people, for the ones that have hallucinations, which I think is part of the definition of schizophrenia. If you don't have hallucinations, it's something a little different. But if you have well, this constant voice it. in your head that says, kill them, 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 drink their blood or you'll die, drink their blood or you'll die, then I think at some point, like any of us could get brainwashed from external sources. So that was the point I was mm -hmm. trying to make. It's like, if you expose yourself to something, yeah. like that's why I was like, if you're always you drinking or you're, you, or you're always watching this, mm -hmm. I made a ter I did a terrible job at making my point because I got a little confused <laughs> as I was doing it. But yes, if you are constantly in that place, mm -hmm. hearing that, you absorb it. Yeah, yeah. We're agreeing. We're saying the same thing, just in different words.
But anyways, fuck this fucking guy. And you know what? If you know a schizophrenic person out there, just be careful. Or who knows if they're medicated? Make sure they stay on their medication if they're alive. Nobody ones. can make sure. I mean, my uncle, no one has been able to make sure that he stays medicated. It's so tough because there's different kinds of schizophrenia and paranoid schizophrenia. He's, is... a, he's a schizoid. Okay. Schizoid is uh, slightly different. But with schizophrenia, if they're the paranoid type, they already, like, predisposed to thinking that people are against them and conspiring against them. So my trying to get them like to, that. yeah, trying to get them to like take their medication is like near impossible if they're not currently already medicated. So my uncle asks me if my other uncle Cliff, Roberta's husband, is paying me to spy on him. Yeah. That's what he was always asking me when I would talk to him on Facebook Messenger. Yeah. He's like, why did you contact me out of the blue? And I was like, because I wanted to know who you were. Because I hear all these things about you and I wanted my own opinion. And he goes, okay. And then a month later, he brings it up again. When I opened up that I was like having dinner with my other uncle, his brother. That's when he asked if I was being hired yeah. to spy on him for information. And I so asked him, scary. I said, what information do you have? So scary. I mean, I was aware of all this, like we going into it, my and people painted the picture for me of what he was like. And I just wanted to have my own opinion because yeah. my dad also said that Roberta and Cliff were awful. And I am like best friends with Roberta now. Yeah. And like my dad also said all these horrible, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, people take their own personal experiences and biases and twist them to get other people to not like someone else. I have a cousin who I um, get messages occasionally through like Facebook Messenger and they're always really bizarre. And at first I was like, okay, your family. I think I met you like once or twice in my life when I was like, yay, hi. But his, they're just weird. I won't say they've treaded into like harassment territory or anything like sexual wise, but they're always off. And after a while, I just kind of like stopped responding to him. But every couple of months, I'll get the little bubble that pops up on my phone, and it's just, hey, baby. And I'm like, hey, baby, has to, like, stop. What are we, like, in Alabama? Like, fuck, no, stop. I don't engage in that. No, you, you know? Can. After, like, two, three little, like, You don't know. Yeah, after two, anything. three sessions of just, like, oh, hi, cuz. What's up? How's life? You know? After, like, three of those, I was like, is not working for me. <laughs> no. Well, guys, kudos to you for sticking it out if you're at this point in the video because this was really tough this to read. Bad, this bad. was just tough in general. So, um, thank you for watching. If you haven't already, subscribe, like. We have TikTok. We have Instagram, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter, Facebook, Facebook. And we have a buy me a coffee account. Yeah, buy me a coffee. Account. So the link is below and it's also in our banner. Um, and yeah, we hope to see you next week. And thank you so much. We'll have a more cheerful episode next time. I hope. Because <laughs> I'm sad. <laughs> Anyways, bye. Good night. Bye. It's time for bed. I'm so sad. We like both already lost our voice. Go to bed. Go to sleep. Go to bed. I go to sleep with dog. <laughs> lock your doors. Oh yeah, lock your doors, everyone. Oh, I'm gonna start locking my doors.